Hey guys, Chris at the Ultimate Recycler. We have a 1960s era uh, Starburst retro clock. This is a Japanese made one uh, and it has the steel um, spikes. Uh, the most common, well, there's a lot of different sorts of these and they're very collectible by the retro people uh, who are after that sort of 60s decor. And um, you often see the Jungens ones with the teak wooden spikes. They come in different sizes. Now this one is all metal. And as you can see there, it's got a corrosion issue. Very common with anything that takes batteries, and especially clocks, because they sit up on the wall. And this came out of a house that hadn't been lived in for some time. And clearly the battery not only went flat, but then leaked a bit of acid and it's corroded the terminal so it's not going to work unless we do something with that now it's worth repairing and we'll just look at the movement it's a much larger one than you see in modern clocks today um, and it actually has a little electric motor which what which winds up a movement so it's uh it's quite a good movement it's the original movement we could cheat and pull this out and then just put a normal cheap um, Chinese made quartz movement in there but this movement's probably still good we really just need to clean up that corrosion issue the um, the positive end where the positive of the battery goes is actually okay but the negative end is quite badly corroded so you can see there so we're going to repair that we'll clean up the back of the case here as well where it's bubbled through the paint a bit and as I was saying these things are worth repairing because they hold really good really good dollars uh, the Jungen's Teak ones can bring four or five hundred dollars. They sell regularly on eBay for fairly large amounts. Uh, there are two sizes of those. This one's a fairly large, I'm not sure what the um, the wingspan as such would be. It would be, I reckon, two feet, 24 inches. Now it's at about 60 centimetres, 70 centimetres. So it's quite a large one. And from the front, it actually looks good. It's in pretty good condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the hands off and we'll undo the nut under there that holds the movement in. And we'll take this back cover off and we'll take the movement out and we'll just see what's going to be involved in repairing that corroded piece. Okay, I'm going to undo this. They normally have a just a collar or it's not usually a nut. It's just a, a threaded collar that holds the hands on and brass being fairly soft we don't want to just get the pliers on there and reef it round because we're going to mark it so I'm just using a bit of old electrical cord here you could use a bit of rubber or a bit of leather would work just so that we can get a good grip on it but we're not actually marking it and that will turn I've got to hold that top hand and there we go that should be loose so they're not usually very tight but um, don't put your pliers on it and, and ruin all the, the look of the brass. Okay, so these hands are undamaged. The minute hand always comes off uh, first, and sometimes they have a second hand. This one hasn't. And the minute hand normally has a flat section on each side so that it's located in a certain direction, whereas the hour hand, always they always press on, and they're often quite a lot tighter so that you can actually spin them on the shaft if you need to and that is a bit firm so rather than force it we'll get two screwdrivers either side and lever it up very carefully but we won't want to lever on this plate either okay i've just got a couple of little pieces of scrap wood here just to give some leverage point and we're not going to damage anything and a bit of even pressure from both sides and the hour hand should just lever off there we go it's just a, a press on fit and there's a little spacer here let me see if we can zoom into that one a little spacer with a couple of flat sides that just goes under the minute hand and as i said before the hour hand doesn't have flat sides so it can actually spin on the shaft if you need to but it is a fairly tight press fit okay so we've got that apart without any damage now there's often a nut holding the movement through to whatever the face is and this one has two flat sides 
we can use the pliers on that very carefully because we've got flat sides to work with you could equally use a, a small shifter but again you want to be careful not to mark it they're actually not very good pliers those but all these uh, units have nuts and things aren't usually very tight so okay so now we can lift this up and take the movement out from the other side so I've just put a towel down so the face can rest on the towel rather than on the workbench and there's no hands now to be bent now we do have to take this cover off next so a Phillips head screwdriver just two screws and we'll probably respray the whole back piece just so it's all uh, we get rid of all that corrosion take the screws out and this should leave her off it just presses in there there we go so there's quite a bit of corrosion there we'll give it a scrub up with the wire brush and we'll give it a respray now the movement still seems firm but sometimes they have a, a large rubber washer between the movement and the back of the face so a bit of a gentle lever with a screwdriver from a couple of different angles and it should unstick it it's moving a little bit you just got to be careful and patient here we can get it to rock a bit so it's nearly free there we go it's coming free you don't want to force it because remember this plastic is 1960s which is 46 60 years old and it can go quite brittle there we go so yeah look at that that's actually a large sheet of rubber and it had really adhered it's probably still it's probably supposed to be stuck to the back of the or maybe it was supposed to be stuck to the clock because the other side appears quite smooth now so we might even leave that there i don't think we need to take it out we will clean out some of the dusty rusty stuff in here and we might give that a, just a quick spray with a a flat black just to clean it up a bit but that cushioning stuff can stay there and our movements come out complete so um, that's good so now we've got to have a look at this terminal and see what we can do it looks like they slide into slots so that's the good side that side so it's a sheet of spring steel that slides in and it has a wire attached but pretty well the whole center of it Look at that, it's just, that's supposed to be spring steel and there's hardly anything left. So I'll dig all that out. I'm probably going to have to make something. So I'll get the other side out and that'll give me a template to make something. And um, yeah, we've just got to get the right width so it slots in and some sort of spring part and then we'll solder the wire onto it. So I'll pull this all apart now and I'll clean it up. Now just to get this ready for a bit of paint, I'm just going to use some sandpaper and um, just clean up all the loose rusty stuff so that there's nothing loose and the paint will stick to the surface and it'll look a whole lot better. Okay, I've got that section in there cleaned up quite well. There's no loose material there at all. I'm not worried about the tops a bit dusty because a 60 odd year old clock is supposed to be a bit dusty on top, but I want to seal where it's corroded and the other piece um, was actually quite pitted i had to sand it right back i did a wire brush but i actually sanded it right back with some sandpaper to get rid of all the pitting so we'll give that a bit of a spray and then this movement will be right well then this housing will be right and we'll just have to get the movement going we will test that before we actually go to the trouble of making a segment for the battery because I don't want to go to all the trouble of making it and then find that the movement's got another problem so we'll test it first but we'll spray this one for now and we'll get back to this tomorrow now the wires came off the remains of the terminal and it looks pretty good um, it's probably a little corroded on the end, but I'm going to try and hit it with a soldering iron. I might just carve a little bit of the insulation back and just solder a little bit on there and hopefully the solder takes to it and then it'll be okay. If you do get corrosion right down into the wire and it's a lot shorter 
in this case we'd have to actually take the cover off the movement and we can replace the wire from that tab there so um, we could push and put another piece of wire on there but if this takes soldered to the end it will be fine so I'll just try that first and then we'll hook our power supply up Oh yeah, beautiful. It's taken solder nicely. So scraping the bit of corrosion off the wire helps as well. And once we get the heat into it and the solder flows, well, we know the wire is good then. So I've got my power supply set to 1.5 volts. You certainly don't need to own a power supply. You could equally just get a good new battery and, and touch the terminals. But I don't actually have one here. All right, so positive is red. And negative is black and we'll see if we have some action and i felt the motor buzz beneath my thumb and you can see the balance wheel ticking away nicely and i'm not sure if you can hear that ticking but it sounds great so all right that's perfectly fine the um movement looks to be in good order so this is a it's a mechanical clock movement but it's wound sorry about the reflection but it's wound by an electric motor automatically so it must have a spring drive in there and once it gets down to uh, it starts to lose its power from the spring something clicks the motor in and the motor winds it and then you can see it's got a worm gear in there so uh yeah quite a nice little movement all right so that's running fine we are confident now that it will go when it's back in the clock as long as we can manufacture a plate for this end for the negative end for the battery so i'll take this to work and i'll see if i can find some spring steel and just cut out something that's it doesn't have to be quite as um, ornate as that really as long as it's the same width it'll fit in the slot up there and uh, we'll try and get the middle part bent a little bit so it puts a bit of pressure on the battery you notice that even though they were disconnected the power the clock's still running so um, once the spring in there winds down it won't actually recharge via the motor and it will stop all right, so that's all we can do tonight. I'll take it to the shop uh, next chance I get, and we'll try and manufacture another plate for it. So I had a rummage around at the shop this morning looking for something I could use as a terminal. I did find some stainless steel, some sort of spring steel, which would work. However, it's very hard to solder onto stainless steel. You can, but you need a special uh, strong acid flux to do it because of the oxides that build up on the surface of the stainless. Now you'll notice this one's not really soldered, it's more like it's spot welded. So we won't disturb that one because it still makes a connection. But rather than have the issue of connecting the wire to the stainless, I found a thin sheet of copper. Now this was um, out of my scrap bins. It was wrapped around a transformer as shielding. It's nice and thin, and yet it's not super bendy. It's actually been tempered. So I think a piece of that will be perfectly fine and we should be able to solder onto that nicely. So the next step is to mark out the right size and we'll cut a piece out and we'll make a few bending adjustments to try and get it to have a bit of a spring in the middle like this one is. And then we can solder the wire onto it and fit it in. I've just marked this corner out. It should be very easy to cut with good tin snips. We need to get our width fairly critical so that it slides in to the uh, that plastic framework and the ends aren't quite as important there we go beautiful so that should be our right size we shall fabricate the same sort of shape as the other one and uh, we'll then try and solder a piece on or the wire on Right, I've marked out where I've got to cut a section out. I've drilled a little hole in there and I've used that hole to attach it to a piece of scrap wood. And then I can now grind out those sections with a Dremel 
the hole, the other one had a hole where the wire goes through, so uh, I thought I might as well do the same with this one. All right, and then we just need to bend the legs so that it provides a little bit of spring tension when it presses into the plastic. And we'll have to also bend the center section to provide a bit of spring where it pushes against the battery. And there we go, I've got it all cut out and bent to shape and it'll slide in nicely. The legs bent on the sides will give it a bit of tension to hold it in position and the center tab will give some spring for the battery. I just ran a little sanding disc over it to clean it up a bit. Next step is to just, I'll take this in the other room and just tin an area with solder around here. It's always so much easier if you tin the items first which it basically means coat them with solder so you get a good bond and then we'll poke the wire through and just join that on. Okay, I tinned onto the copper really nicely and I've got the wire through it now. Uh, and I've got a little third hand here holding it for me. So we should be able to just join the wire now onto the solder. There we go, that will work fine. Solder certainly sticks really well to nice clean copper. So if we take that off there now, we can move that frame out of the road. And there we have it. Our second battery clamp. And that should just slide down our wires just a little tight. But I think we can get that over there. And he needs a whisker. There we go. And we can push this down and it's going to be nice and tight. And that should work brilliantly. So I can put the other end down now and I just need to find a battery. Right, I've got a battery for it and I've also brought a couple of others home from the shop so I've got some at home here ready in case I need them now I'm going to say this about batteries spend the extra money and buy a good one buy you might as well almost buy the most expensive battery in the battery rack at the store because it works out cheaper in the long run you saw the corrosion in this it happens in toys it happens in all sorts of equipment and especially clocks cheap batteries will leak acid and pretty well destroy a lot of things. This was fortunate that the housing was mostly plastic and it was only a little tab we had to fix. But in a lot of cases, the battery acid can get into the works and pretty well totally destroy whatever you're running off the batteries. So, so don't skimp on batteries, buy a good quality one and you've got much less chance of any leakage of acid. Now, I did check this and I've had to spread these terminals in a bit. I bent them a bit further, even the existing one. Uh, it possibly might have been worth my while to put a spring at one end, how you often see in battery compartments. But this one didn't have a spring from original, it just had the two tabs. And I've bent them out a fair bit, so they have a bit of spring in them anyway. So the battery now will go in and hold firm. Um, but it's worthwhile if you're pulling apart stuff, particularly... There we go, and it's wound it up straight away. Uh, if you're pulling apart stuff, particularly um, transistor radios and things that aren't worth fixing, or even remote controls from TVs, I sometimes grab the little springs and connectors and put them in a tub because it is a very common problem and it's worthwhile having a, a tub full of various uh, metal tabs and springs for repairing future jobs. I've just put the movement back into the clock housing, secured it with the front uh, collar screw, and there was a little plastic shim that I've put in there. How clean does this look, hey? Much better than when we first saw it. Let's see how the screw, there we go. So the clock movement actually has a molding to be hung for hanging, but this one actually has a hanger hole off the back bracket. So once we screw this up, we can put the battery back in. Beautiful, tick, 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 nice and neat, all finished. Just got to put the hands on the front. And there's our Starburst clock ticking away happily. 
Uh, it's now the correct time, it's 10 past 3 in the afternoon. It's pretty hot in my shed. Uh, I'm pleased to get this job finished. The only comment I'll make is if I was doing this again, I would probably fabricate a spring to hold one end of the battery because it has dropped out a couple of times. And because these uh, large size batteries, what are they? Let's have a look at this one. They're a D size. They're the biggest 1.5 volt batteries that you buy. Um, because they're so heavy, it does put a bit of load on the the little spring tabs to hold it there. Now, admittedly, it will be up on the wall vertical, but it did drop out on me once or twice. So I think that would be the only improvement I'd make, would be to, even though it wasn't original, I would put a spring one into that battery. But it's back how it was originally now, and uh, I'm pretty happy with that repair. Hope you... Um, hope you learned something from that um, I never know what I'm going to do or how far it's going to go as far as a repair job goes but it's all about us saving these things um, a bit of corrosion should not mean the death of your clock and especially something like this these retro clocks this should make about $300 retail I'd imagine so okay thanks for watching we'll catch you in the next video bye